Hey guys, what's up? It's Big Jack Films here, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this very special podcast video thing, whatever. Um, as you guys know, it's December 2016, and what's really important about this month is that it is the 40th anniversary of one of my favorite films of all time, the 1976 remake of King Kong. And, as you guys know, I've already reviewed the damn thing, so what the hell is this about? Well, I figured since I've reviewed it and overanalyzed the shit out of it and talked about it in such detail in my review, I figured I'd do a fan commentary. Basically, I'm going to be doing an entire audio commentary on the entire goddamn movie, but um, here's the interesting twist. As far as I know, with all the different video formats and releases the movie has gotten, there has never been a full audio commentary on the movie. And I figured, well, why don't not only I talk about the movie at great length and in great detail, as well as maybe review it a little bit, and give it kind of an extra taste, a little bit of an extra feeling, but on this commentary, you're not only going to be hearing from me, but you're going to be hearing from archival interviews from the filmmakers, the cast, including Jessica Lange, Charles Grodin, Rick Baker, Jeff Bridges, and Dino De Laurentiis. All archival interviews are going to be featured in this commentary for your enjoyment. Now, a few things before we get started. Uh, the first thing is, I will not be showing the entire movie on this channel to avoid copyright infringement. That is something that I know a lot of people who do fan commentaries don't do. They don't show the movie on their on the video. So, with that said, I would ask anybody who has a copy of the movie on uh, on DVD. We're looking for mostly the Region One DVD um, for this commentary. If you have it. Um, or just find somewhere to get it, I don't know, but even if you don't have the movie, we're going to be showing stills from the film to let you know where we're at in the movie. But um, anyway, yeah, so just make sure you have a Region 1 DVD or a Blu-ray of the film, um, and we're just going to be talking through the entire thing for you to enjoy and shit. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll let you guys uh, load up the film, and uh, yeah, we'll just get started. So you can probably pause this, load load the DVD or whatever, and um, I'll make sure you guys are good with that. All right, we good? You sure? <laughs> okay, let's get started. On my mark, so make sure you're at the very beginning of the movie, basically zero seconds. Uh, that's what we want to do with this uh, commentary, okay? So here we go. All right, three, two, one, play. Okay, so I guess the first thing to talk about with this movie is actually the first thing they shot, which is actually the first shot in the movie that we're going to see in a sec. This was the, this bit here coming up now, this was the very first shot in the movie that they filmed, and it was actually the first thing they, like, filmed entirely in the production. And... What they basically did was, because they were competing with Universal to do the remake, and they were kind of, the clock was ticking and racing at the time. So, they decided the first thing they'd shoot is the dock at the Petrox Explorer, which was, I believe, shot in California. Uh, they It was actually a really cold night, because there was a lot of people working, there was the little uh, venues and everything going on. Uh, but, and also the, uh, Petrox Explorer was actually a ship bought off by the U.S. Navy called the RV Melville, and it, after this movie, it sailed and was, a, it's a, it's an American research vessel, so it's an actual vessel that does, like, oceanographic stuff. So, anyway, uh, they, it ended up sailing so much after this movie, and then it was sold to, recently to some other, uh, company or whatever, some other... Uh, naval company. I, I'm not sure which country it was, but anyway, that's what ha that's where it is. So if you ever want to find the RV Melville, just look up where it's at at the moment. Um, so as we see, we got John Randolph as uh, Perko, I believe. Yes, Perko. And here comes Jeff Bridges. This 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 was again the first shot he did in the movie. Uh, and as you guys know, there is an extended cut of this movie with a shit ton of deleted scenes. And there's a scene in the bar, in a bar, where he actually drugs one of the crew members and steals the shirt that he's wearing. And that's how he's able to get into the ship, on, onto the ship, because he disguises himself as one of the crew members. Uh, but anyway, I think Jeff Bridges did a fantastic job on this movie. I think he, like, he's the better protagonist out of all the films. Um, but better than, you know, um, Bruce Cabot or even Adrian Brody. 
Charles Grum uh, playing the amazingly uh, eating scenery Fred Wilson. Um, he's I love this character so much. I love how he's like he's got the mustache and everything. Um, a lot of the I'm not too sure if a lot of the ship's interiors were shot in a studio or on the ship itself. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. I've, I've read so many books on this goddamn movie <laughs> that um, there's a lot there's a lot to know in terms of detail. Uh, this bit coming up with Jeff Bridges where he uh, where Jack uh, basically does this stunt where he goes across on the rope. Uh, I believe they did that in one take, and everybody was so scared that Jeff was going to, like, fall over or whatever. So, yeah, right here. He did this whole stunt himself, and it was all done in one take, I believe, on two angles. And that's how they did uh, that entire thing. Uh, but, yeah, there, there he goes, getting on the Petrarch's Explorer, getting ready to uh, find whatever's out there. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I, but this was the first, again, first day of shooting... Uh, and I believe they spent maybe two, three days at the most. And then they actually had to shut down for a bit because they had to, again, compete with Universal at the time. And here comes John Barry's amazing score. Um, I love this score to death. Um... I'm not sure the details of how he got involved, but um, what I love about the score is that it's extremely powerful and very... Um, uh, yeah, that's all it is. It's powerful. It's a huge, huge part of the movie, and I absolutely love it. So, John Barry, amazing score. Uh, it's funny, it was actually... The original title for this movie was King Kong The Legend Reborn, because Universal were calling its movie The Legend of King Kong... And in order to not deal away with any copyright from RKO, uh, Paramount and Dino De Laurentiis called it uh, King Kong The Legend Reborn. Actually, an interesting thing we should do now is maybe uh, turn the uh, commentary over to an archival interview from Lorenzo Simple Jr., who uh, talks about uh, how what was what it was like writing the script and um, what Dino De Laurentiis had in mind when it came to uh, shooting this movie. I mean, Dino loved the big monkey, as he called it. And I thought the idea was just do an appealing worldwide love story, you know, a tragic love story with wonderful spectacle. Dino's motivation in making Kong, aside from all of these things, he really wanted to make, and thought he could, make the uh, biggest motion picture success of all time. But yeah, so... Th it, and again, it was also based on the scripts by Marion C. Cooper, Ruth Rose. But uh, I think Lorenzo did a good job on this uh, script. He actually uh, gave it more uh, comedic timing. I guess it's because he worked on the 1966 Batman, so that's a plus. Uh, a lot of the shots of the uh, Petrox Explorer at sea were done by the second unit uh, on uh, out at sea, and they shot everything. And then I believe they shut down. I believe second unit finished and wrapped up after that. This scene here was actually, this was actually a built set in the sound stages at MGM in California. Uh, basically, they had the set of the ship, both the interiors and exteriors, on a rocking platform that would go left and right and, like, kind of, like, lean back and forth. And they would have a huge dump tanks come in and flood the entire set. Jeff Bridges spent that whole day getting soaked inside the boat. Uh, but that was a lot of fun, so that how, uh, how they were able to do th these sequences in the storm was just by having the sets go back and forth. I love this scene with uh, Fred Wilson and uh, Captain Ross, because... Um, it just the, what I love is Charles Grodin's just standing there completely quiet, because he knows he sold everything... And he's risking his life for this island. He like he's risking to find the soil, and Ross is just playing around like a joke. And I love the whole, the set itself was cool because you have the food rocking back and forth and spilling all over the actors. And this bit where Charles Grodin goes out and like just kind of storms off, and then he gets comes back completely soaked. Um, I think Captain Ross, um, not as memorable as Captain Inglehorn from the original, but I I do like the character. Um, I think he's really cool. Actually, another person to talk about the story and uh, the, of how the remake came to fruition is actually Rick Baker in this small bit. Rick Baker, as you know, was the guy who was in the Kong suit 
in the in this movie, and he had some things to say about uh, what they were going to do with this remake. So here's Rick Baker to talk about it. The attitude that Dino and, and company had was that the original King Kong was a piece of junk compared to the movie that they were going to make. You know. But anyway, so there was um, there was a lot to write on in the, on this movie because they didn't want to like everybody knew they were going to compete with the original. Lorenzo actually said that he um, Dino De Laurentiis had said that he wanted to strive away from the original as much as possible. Uh, so they came up. So they only used the source material to um, like when it was absolutely needed. And Lorenzo just basically came up with some new stuff. Uh, this is the meeting scene. I actually really like this scene. This is one of the better scenes in the movie because it really gets down what the plot's about. Now, I'd actually like to turn the commentary over to uh, Charles, an archival interview with Charles Grodin as uh, he talks about uh, how he got the part of Fred Wilson. So let's hear what Charles Grodin has to say. I originally wanted to play the Jeff Bridges part. And, uh, Dino De Laurentiis and John Gillerman, the director, wanted me in the movie, and there were these two parts, the love interest with the Jessica and the, uh, the guy who captures King Kong and brings him back uh, to exploit him and is responsible for his death. And I had already, I had already played uh, a few parts in the movies, uh, like the Heartbreak Kid, where I left my wife on my honeymoon. So I really didn't want to be responsible for the death of like one of the most beloved animal figures. Uh, in the movies, so but I wanted to play the uh, the love interest, and and Dino said no, no, no. The uh, the, the best part is uh, is this uh, is this part. Fred Wilson is the character's name. I said, Mr. De Laurentiis, they're going to hate me. They're going to hate me in this part. He said, No, they're not going to hate you. You go to look for to for oil. You not find oil. You find the big ape. What are you going to do? You bring him back. Everyone going to understand with the free enterprise system. But yeah, so Charles Grodin, like, actually, he, he mostly started on Broadway, and he was a huge thing on Broadway in Manhattan, and then he moved on to doing acting in movies, and um, he, he done a, he's done a ton of shit. If you guys actually don't know, he's the dad in the first Beethoven movie, and I was really shocked later, 20 years later after I saw that movie, and after watching Cog 76 and looking up what he did, I'm like, wait, he's the dad from Beethoven? <laughs> I thought that was actually really cool. Uh, Roy Bagley, played by, I believe I'm going to butcher this name, Rain Abbott uh, Jones. Uh, I'm not too sure. I, I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong, sir. I absolutely love you in this movie. Uh, he's the comic relief of this film. And I think his dialogue and his comedic timing is perfect. Um, I think he's really, really funny. If I ever met this guy, I would love to just talk to him about what it was like to work on this. What are the original... Uh, bits they had in the script discussing how they got the church to Skull Island was actually that uh, Fred Wilson's character had actually found, again, documents from Washington, D.C., but they were originally from the Vatican, and they were archival charts or a map from the Vatican that uh, he would find, and uh, that's how he would get to uh, the ship to go to the island and get the oil. Um, this whole fog bit of how the, uh, how the composition works, uh, I believe will come into play with Kong Skull Island. I believe that will be the case, um, as it's kind of the same thing. But, uh, yeah, this, um, whole scene is actually really great. It's well shot. It really gets down to what the story's about and, uh, what's happening and the legends of Kong and everything. Uh, a lot of this was, again, I don't believe this was shot on the, sh on the ship. This was shot on a soundstage. Um, they built the set. Uh, Jeff Bridges coming in. I think, you know, that this scene actually is really good for Jeff because he, um, he gets to really bring on what the legends are about in this movie. Uh, I believe we should now turn the commentary back to Lorenzo Simple Jr. And he's going to talk about here about how Dino's obsession all of this movie was to beat Jaws at the time. And also, we're going to hand it to Dino De Laurentiis in this track as well. So here's Lorenzo and Dino De Laurentiis talking about how they wanted to beat Jaws. This was after Jaws had come out, which was credited with revolutionizing the business. This was making the so-called event movie. I mean, I believe almost everybody to this day says that Jaws started that cycle, which is with us 
more than ever today. And uh, Dino thought that he could make a bigger event movie. There's no question that that was an important uh, motivation of his, to beat Jaws. This was Dino as showman, everything he dreamed about himself. He would show, show the world with this movie. Uh, it would be the biggest event of every time, and he absolutely was basking in that, that he was just absolutely adoring it. Probably of all the movies, the one where he most let it all go as, as a Dino De Laurentiis production, as a showman, it was all his, all his. One day, one uh, guy said to me, why you don't put the scene in which King Kong beat the Jaws? <laughs> <laughs> I do feel, um, one of the only gripes I really have with this movie, and that's saying a lot because this is my favorite film, um, is that there's no dinosaurs in this, and that's the only real downside to the film, is that there are no dinosaurs, uh, and, you know, like, originally Dino De Laurentiis, they considered it, and when Universal was doing their remake, they were going to use dinosaurs because they were more basing on the 19... Uh, 33 film, and they had actually gotten, wanted to get Jim Danforth, uh, who did the animation for When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, and uh, they were going to get him to do the animation. They were also suggesting using a man in an ape suit, um, with, I believe, Bob Burns came in to do a test uh, for that. Uh, but, um, actually, Dino had suggested maybe using dinosaurs, but he wanted to focus more on the love story, and I think that's the best thing about this film, is that it's more focused on the love story between the Beauty and the Beast, and um, that's what makes the scenes on Skull Island happen. The book that Captain Ross is carrying that was Jeff Bridges', uh, that was actually on eBay at one point. Uh, I, I don't know who bought it, but I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, I love, the, actually, this scene where um, Jeff Bridges spots Dwan. And, um, again, this was all shot on the ship, I believe. Yeah, it was shot on the ship. And, um, yeah, apparently, I, I don't know how much was shot on the ship. I believe a lot of it was done on sound stages in the studio. And here she comes. Here comes the gorgeous Jessica Lang as Dwan and... I gotta be honest, guys, she's the hotter babe in the entire Kong legacy. I think she is the most attractive. I love her character. She's played as, uh, obviously, like a complete, you know, oh, like, like, it seems most of the time she looks kind of like she wants to just party around and everything. But I, I don't know, I don't know, I just love her character. I think she's very, um, self-acclaimed, I guess. I love that, uh, jacket, she's, or that. I love that costume she's wearing. <laughs> it's a jacket. It's funny. Actually, in this whole scene when she was on the raft, uh, Jessica Lang uh, was actually... She didn't know it, but she was surrounded by sharks. The sharks were swimming, circling around the raft, and um, she ended up... Uh, she never knew until after they finished shooting, so I thought that was kind of interesting. This scene was also shot um, in a soundstage. Again, all most of the interiors were. Um, Joe Perko, wow, he's strong. <laughs> and um, but I and I, I it's funny because Joe um, John Randolph, I believe, who plays him, um, ended up working on other films. He ended up working on Superman too. He's um, one of Zod's henchmen in Superman and the Christopher Reeve Superman films. There's a scene that was actually cut from uh, this uh, from the from the film that it, it's a simple scene, but it has uh, Jeff Bridges locked up in the uh, in the cargo hold or whatever, and um, he ends up just knocking on the door and uh, asking for food. Um, I can see why they cut it out; it's kind of pointless. But if you guys ever get the extended TV cut, uh, definitely take a look at all the scenes that were cut in the film because there's a couple that actually were like. Really disappointed those were taken out. The film had a lot of production problems, I believe. I believe it did go over budget. 
at times. Uh, there was one time where it was costing De La Laurentiis like seven, seven thousand dollars a minute or seven hundred thousand dollars a minute. I'm not too sure. There was a, there were a few problems. Uh, they had to continuously shut down production because a lot of like because they'd finish a, a a whole bit of scenes on a set, but then the next thing is sets weren't ready, so they had to wait until the sets were built um, to uh, get through the movie. And uh, it's hard to believe that they had an entire year on this film to work on it, uh, to, to like film it, shoot it edit it, post-production, everything. It took them a year, and everybody was under pressure with the under pressure with the Christmas deadline that they were supposed to do, or supposed to get it released at the time. And uh, here comes uh, Jack and Dwan's first meeting. This scene is actually really nice. I really, I really like this bit. Um, I feel uh, this is the first big scene for Jessica. Um, she plays it off really well. Uh, actually, on this set, I believe everybody was like had to be super quiet because John Gellerman, the director, had to um, like really focus on this first scene with Jessica, and uh, he uh, he ended up he he was known to freak out a couple times on set because he he was a perfectionist, and um, I thought that I mean he's a great director and I think he did a really good job on this scene. All the actors do really well on this bit. Um, Jessica really pulls through um, for her first scene. She's really emotional too. Like the, she, at first she's really kind of upset, but then she kind of grows into like, "Hey, you know, I was rescued. That's awesome." Um, actually, we should actually should turn it over to Jessica Lang. Uh, here's an interview she did with Jimmy Kimmel a few years back on uh, how she got the part of Dwan. Let's uh, take a listen. You know, I had no intention of, like, this being my first film or my first acting job. I'd come back from Paris to New York to study acting. Uh-huh. Okay. Because I felt there was no future with the other thing. Right. So <laughs> I came back to New York. I was studying acting. And out of the blue, I got a call saying, would you want to audition for a film? Which I thought was kind of, you know. Sure. So I said, sure, yeah. I mean, it sounded like a lark, and they were going to... I mean, I was living on, like, you know, 50 cents a day. I was waitressing at the Lion's Head in New York. So they prom they were going to fly me to Los Angeles and put me up in some fancy Beverly Hills. I've never been here before. Put me up in a fancy hotel, and I thought, wow, why not? Why yeah. not? And I went in, and I did this audition, and they didn't, you know, they didn't pay any attention to me, and then... I started doing the scenes, and then a few more people drifted in to watch, and then, you know, then finally the producer came, and then the director showed up, and by the time I left town, they'd given me this part. But yeah, uh, Jessica's, it's interesting, because this kind of made and almost destroyed her career, this movie, but even though I think she did... Absolutely fantastic in this. I mean, this, Rob Roy, and American Horror Story are some of her best roles to date. Um, she's very quiet about this film. I don't know why. Uh, she's She rarely talks about it. I mean, she only really talks about how she got the job. And um, but, uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to see, like, a behind-the-scenes documentary with all the cast members uh, getting interviewed and talking about uh, making the film. Because I think it's very deserving of this movie, um, because it is part of the Kong legacy, and there's a lot of story to go behind with this movie. So, it'd be cool to see some sort of behind-the-scenes documentary with the cast and crew coming together to talk about it. Dwan was actually supposed to be um, the Jack uh, Prescott character as a paleontologist, and uh, Prescott was supposed to be, I believe, like, one of the crew members, like, one of the crew members who falls in love with her. Um, and she was, and Dwan was supposed to be the stowaway, and uh, who sneaks on the ship. But uh, they decided to uh, change it to her being found on a raft from an exploding uh, yacht, because they said it would have, uh, Dito said it would have added more um, 
of, uh, it would go from, like, a realistic-looking film to, uh, a fantasy film immediately if you, because, honestly, who, you, it'd be very rare to find, like, somebody out at sea after a yacht explosion, but it, 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 t it takes the film from its realism to its fantasy elements, uh, uh, very well. And I also love the fact that this whole boat voyage ain't an hour long, <laughs> and instead it's, like, 20 minutes uh, in, until we get to the islands, about 20, 25 minutes. Um, love this montage, um, of, of the, of the whole s journey to the island and Juan getting to know the crew. Uh, John Barry's score once again doing absolutely fantastic. There was also a deleted scene, again, from the extended cut where, um, these, uh, two crew members are, uh, spying on Juan showering. And Jeff Bridges would come in and uh, spot them and then have them go overboard. And obviously they'd get rescued, but um, it, it was an interesting scene. Uh, I do see why it was cut out because of length and everything. There was also a scene where uh, the crew member were playing card games before the uh, meeting at the in the ship's interior. I really like this shot here with them just fishing and them goofing around. It's really sweet. One of the biggest risques about this film out of any of the Kong lore is that it really uh, doesn't hold back on some of the nudity. And this was a PG film at the time. PG-13 was not um, a thing back in 76 until the 90s. Um, but they showed a lot in this movie. I'm really surprised that they haven't re-rated this film. Another great shot of Lang looking absolutely gorgeous. Now here's the big reveal of the fog of Skull Island. First of all, great shot here, but um, apparently that fog was such a pain in the ass to do. Um, they basically had all these little boats with uh, big fans and uh, with big fog elements like fog machines, and they would go surround the entire area uh, near the ship to create the fog bank. And unfortunately, it really bugged a lot of the island neighbors, like the other coat, like on, around the area, a lot of the, um, islanders and stuff could see the fog from the distance, and they were kind of like, what the, they were all like, what the hell is that, you know? So, and Gunnerman was really having a hard time trying to direct every, direct the fog and everything, and, uh, but it, I think it overall turned out really well. You have the radar, that's a huge part of the movie, um, it is magic though, like, I, I, I don't understand how it works, how it's able to track Kong and everything. And um, I love how the crew are just like, oh, it's just a glitch. It's just a glitch. I think we should also uh, now turn it back to uh, Dino De Laurentiis to talk about... Um, looking back on Kong's success, so here's Dino to talk about it. And in fact, we did a nice good movie. No good like the original, because you never be like the original, you know. But it was very successful all around the world, we make a lot of money. In every place in the world. We did in the first three days in the United States, seven million dollars. We broke an all record. In Japan, in France, in Italy, it's the same. Just fantastic. I love this scene as well, with the lighting on the sun reflecting on the ocean and everything. It's a great, great, great shot. One of the things uh, here is actually um, Fred Wilson was a married man. I wonder what happened to the wife and kids when he uh, got killed. <laughs> and what, what happened to them? That would be an interesting take if someone could write a story on that. One of the things a lot of people do grape on is Dwan basically, like, to get what she wants, she will kind of seduce the other guys. Um, I see nothing wrong with that. I think it, um, in some respects, she, she's just, you know, a character who wants to have fun and adventure and doesn't want to be just the girl on board the ship. And, uh, she, 
takes matters into her own hands and trying to uh, go on the adventure and everything. This film has 1970s written all over it, um, especially with the humor and stuff. And again, Lorenzo Simple Jr.'s writing, uh, he did the score, or he did not the score, he did the the scripts and stuff for the 60s Batman show. So you can see a lot of Batman, the campy aspects in this uh, script, in the, in the script and in the movie. The scene coming up where uh, the crew are going through the, the fog on the island, uh, again, a bitch to shoot. Uh, basically, what happened was is that uh, John Gollerman and the camera crew were on a boat. Uh, the cast and crew were on this boat, as you see here, and they kept getting lost through the fog. They had to. John was having a trouble kind of directing everything around the fog, so it says, go right, go left, go right, go left, but then they would get lost. Sometimes the boats would collide with each other, and it was a huge mess um, in terms of shooting it. So, I'm not too sure if they actually ended up just shooting the rest of it um, in, I guess, like, on the boat itself, which it looks like here, that's what they shot. Uh, coming up, the shot of uh, the scene with them getting to Skull Island, and uh, we finally get to see it, which was shot on the uh, amazing island of Kauai. Uh, Twenty years later, Jurassic Park would be shot there. And, uh, they, uh, but it looks great, uh, the island itself. Uh, it, and the, and the whole scene, apparently, like, the whole scene itself where they get to the shores of the island, uh, again was trouble because they, um, had trouble with the surf on the beach, and the scene was shot on a, a beach called Cathedral Beach on Kauai, and they had, uh, apparently had, like, current trouble, so the boat would keep either capsizing or almost falling, people almost falling off because the waves were so strong when they were getting to the beach and it was a huge problem for them. They actually at some points did go back and shoot it in California, uh, when, especially when Jack and the crew come back to save Duan from uh, the natives. Uh, the night shots were all shot in California, so this whole bit on Cathedral Beach was honestly just for this one scene and all the scenes with uh, Wilson and uh, the crew uh, setting up to capture Kong. Another interesting thing that happened was when they shot this scene, there was uh, a, a newlywed couple that were having their honeymoon on the beach, and they were relaxing, because uh, Cathedral Beach is very kind of untouched, like not many people go to it. And it's a beautiful beach, by the way. Like, look at the, the reason it's called Cathedral Beach is for the arc uh, tunnel that's in the distance there in those rocks. But anyway, so uh, this couple was on the beach, and when they saw the crew come in, they were like, wait, what the hell's going on here? Uh, and not wanting to, like, just kick them out, they uh, offered the uh, couple to just stand by and watch how, what it takes to make a movie. But obviously the couple got bored, and they uh, ended up uh, leaving the scene um, with their honeymoon kind of ruined. Shooting on Kauai was actually uh, a little difficult because a lot of the locations they shot on was uh, were very remote. Uh, there wasn't much in terms of civilization or anything. And it was, honestly, this was the, one of the first movies that was ever shot on Kauai. Um, which, and for a lot of the uh, community there, it was a great, uh, really cool treat for a film crew to come in and shoot uh, a movie, especially a movie like Kong on this island. Uh, also, uh, Funny enough, 40 years later, Kong Skull Island, uh, the new film, was shot on the same island. It was shot on Kauai as well. So, it's funny how 40 years later, history re repeats itself. But anyway, so the, um, the, island, the uh, island shooting, because a lot of the locations they had to go to were completely remote. Uh, they had to take it by helicopter. And it would take, like, an hour and a half to get the entire crew and cast there uh, to each location every day in the helicopters. And the helicopters were, I believe, Huey H-1s that were left over from Vietnam, and a lot of the pilots were from Vietnam. So they um, ended up uh, having them help out in terms of flying the crew around. 
uh, they, there was actually a great story about how civilian um, c- um, civilians on the island, as they were uh, doing their thing, they saw a helicopter fly by with a porta potty, <laughs> and this porta potty was going to the location because again there was no place to go to the bathroom on these locations, and they had to like have a porta potty uh, choppered in there. Uh, there were instances where the choppers did have problems as well, because. Um, so I think one of them ended up almost crashing and stuff, and the crew had to duck out of the way, which was a huge scare, um, and so on. I love this, actually, this whole bit with uh, Jeff and Jessica and the waterfall in the background. Beautiful location as well. I guess we should turn uh, the uh, commentary back to Dino De Laurentiis as he talks about uh, what it's like to make a film like Kong. To do what I do, you must love to do your job. Yeah. I love to make a movie. To make a movie is my hobby. It is very important yeah. because you just to do for a job, you can work every, every day, 18 hours a day, night, uh, Saturday, Sunday, Easter. You know, it's impossible to do it. You, you, re- yeah. you realize Billy, in the last 16, 17 months, I don't take one day vacation just to be ready for Kong. This is one of the locations that was extremely remote and difficult to get to, and the only way to do it was or, or by hiking. Uh, any like any way to get to these locations, you had to basically walk and travel through all this rocky terrain and everything, which was a huge hassle. And now we're coming on to the basically the first visual effects shot in the movie, which is a matte painting of the wall. Um, this shot was I think this shot actually turned out really well. But yeah, that's an entire matte painting of the wall that was uh, added in in uh, post-production. Some of the humor, I will agree, is a little hard to follow. Like the whole bit with Jeff Bridges saying, you know, there's an uninhabited beer hall with a mechanical band. Even even I don't get that. I, I don't get that one bit, honestly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little, um, it's a little off-putting. Charles Grodin's Charles Grodin's great in this movie. Um, I love how he's just chewing up scenery every t- every chance he gets. Like the scene here, um, he is played as an over the top character, much different than the Carl Denham in the original, uh, played by Robert Armstrong. And here we come on the natives. Yay! The natives are showing up, and I I actually love the guns that the crew use on here. Um, if you guys know the name of the guns, comment below. So yeah, the natives coming up. Uh, this was, again, it wasn't shot on Kauai. The wall was not shot on the island, unfortunately. It was shot in California on the back lot of MGM. And this wall cost like $800,000 to, to build. And uh, and the music as well by John Barry. This was the first track uh, he did for the movie was all the native stuff. Because they had to, they had to have it on the day to play on the, on the, on the boom mics or on the... On the, on the speakers for the uh, natives to do the choreography. And that was the first things they did. But a lot of this was shot on the back lot. The hill that the, that the Petrox crew are on, are on is on a, a rocky uh, slope that was made from, I believe, polystyrene and um, a lot of uh, uh, concrete. The natives in this are really, are really cool. I really like the look of these natives. The dance choreography um, was really well put together as well. And interesting fact, when they were uh, shooting a lot of these scenes, uh, there was a lot of scares on this set. Uh, There was a bomb threat, apparently, when they were shooting, as well as a sniper threat, which all turned out to be false, but the crew didn't want to take a chance, so they just kind of, even though they carried through shooting, it was a bit of a scare on the set. This was actually one of the sets that they had to film on the day it was actually finished, uh, because the, even the paint was just drying that day, because they were in such a rush to get this out for Christmas of uh, '76 that they had to um, 
can basically shoot when sets were ready. That was the rule on, on the shooting, was like, when sets are built, when sets are painted and ready, we shoot. We just go on until we finish shooting. Um, I actually like this bit, how they explain why Kong likes blondes. It's because the natives um, use, you know, fake wigs and everything to make it look like the, the native girls have, you know, blonde hair, which I think is kind of interesting. Jeff Bridges' camera is a Nikon camera, for any camera enthusiasts out there. And then we have the Witch Doctor. Um, really cool idea, I guess. Um, I, do, I, I do agree, he is kind of like a male stripper, almost. <laughs> Which is kind of funny, but I, I love the look on uh, that costume and everything. The costume designs on this film are also absolutely fantastic. I think they get very overlooked. Uh, the native costumes, uh, Dwan's costumes are great. And they're, they're, they're really cool. And of course, much like the original, uh, the crew gets spotted by the natives. I, do, I, I am. It's interesting the fact that they went for oil instead for a film, which I at the time the reason for it was because obviously in the 1970s there was a huge oil crisis going on. There was um, oil prices were up and the entirety of like fuel was running on empty at a lot of places. So Lorenzo figured, you know, instead of film, let's go instead of them making a movie, let's go for them uh, finding oil on the island, and. Um, I, I think it actually gives it, it makes the film make it a product of its time because it does take place during the oil crisis and it, it makes sense. It does make sense for them to do something like that. This scene, again, if you go to the extended cut, is a lot longer. I believe it's like 10 minutes longer. <laughs> um, the reason for the extended cut was because NBC had bought uh, the film to show on television, but they wanted to stretch it out for two nights. So they had, uh, I believe an original rough cut of the movie put together that was like three hours long. So they had to, uh, split the movie in half and show it on like one, part one on the Saturday night and then part two on the Sunday night. And the extended TV cut only aired from like on 1978, 1979, 1980, and 1983. Uh, were the only times it really aired on television. And finding a copy is extremely hard to come by unless you have, like, a taped VHS from the time. Or, um, you know, if you find it from, like, private collectors who have a 16mm print. Again, the set is absolutely fantastic. The railing that the natives go up is really cool. Um... I just love the look of, of this entire set, and it's sad it's no longer there. They obviously had to take it down. Like, if you go there now to where the set is, um, it's nothing but houses, because the MGM lot got sold off, I believe, to a real estate company. And of course, um, this is different from the original, how they shoot in the air to scare off the natives. Um, it's only explained in the original on how, uh, how they were able to hold off the natives, but in this one they actually explained, we just shot them in the air, we just fired a couple of rounds over their heads, and they ran off like scared rabbits. <laughs> of course, smoking was a huge thing in movies, um, you don't see that anymore, um, so I actually think it makes a... Uh, I, honestly, like, I, I'm all against smoking, but I think it makes Lang look a lot cooler. So again, they were competing with Universal at the time to uh, get the movie out. Um, Universal script was very much like the original. There were a lot of things changed from the original uh, due to legal disputes because... Um, even though Paramount had the written contract to do a remake, Universal had a handshake and a verbal contract which they felt they were defense against, and they were going to use their script based on the uh, novelization by Dallas W. Lovelace, which went under public domain. So uh, they felt that was their good defense, that the story was under public domain, the novelization. Uh, and to change uh, a few things around to avoid copyright from RKO, they ended up, uh, you know, changing the ship's name to the Panama Queen, 
they uh, changed up the dinosaur scenes, so like the Stegosaurus was instead like uh, a different an a different creature. Um, the Brontosaurus was a Parasaurolophus. The T Rex was actually a Triceratops, and uh, the Pteranodon scene was a um, was a, a, a weird dino vulture thing, and as well the snake scene was like a uh, I believe a giant centipede, which would have been really cool. I love this joke Charles Grodin makes. <laughs> like, that's really funny. I love this scene too because it shows like how cold-hearted Fred is. Like he does not give a crap about the environment, and you know he plays it as like the greedy oil businessman, which I, I it makes him more vilified and. I always saw the Denim character, not much in the original, but in other films, more as a villain. And um, a guy who's just like, does not give a crap about the people around him. And uh, will do anything to get what he wants. Another deleted scene that was cut right in here was where the crew is just chilling in a party room. Which again, I can see why it was cut out, because um, it was uh, just it was taking too much time. The scene was actually cut down as well. Uh, in the extended cut, it does go on a bit longer, and there's a bit more dialogue added in. Um, it, it is kind of missed, but I mean, there's it, it. The film is fine as it is, as it, as it like the pace goes a lot faster. Okay, now I think we're gonna turn it to uh, Jeff Bridges to talk about what it was like to work with uh, Jessica Lange. She was a beatnik. She. Uh had come from Europe, was involved with street theater there, and mime, and this sort of thing. I thought, wow, this girl is awful hip. How's she going to play this blonde bimbo? I like to think uh, when Jeff Bridges says, oh, should we watch the old movie with the crew? Thinking he might be referencing the original, which I think is kind of cool. The scene is actually really nice because it, it allows the characters to finally kind of admit they kind of like each other. I think it's really sweet. This scene also, I believe, was shot... I'm not too sure. I believe it was maybe a tank on the um, on the studio. Maybe on the ship. I'm not too sure. Maybe, like, around the docking area. Because, obviously, you can't really shoot the stuff out in the open water. Because the waves could be a little uh, fanatic. I love the chemistry these guys have. They're, it's really It's really nice. And it's also like, it's also a very reminiscent of the original, you know, Jack and, you know, Dwan or Jack and Anne, the original, you know, hanging out and everything. And then Dwan gets kidnapped by the natives, and it's very similar to the original. Uh, I think it actually, th this is one of the times where they had to use the source material to uh, make it flow like an actual Kong movie. I love how Fred is so confident that they're going to find oil that he doesn't even think about any of the negative parts. Um, this line, I love that. Think that like Those who think negative don't get high at the Petrarch's Tower. So he's playing it up. He's playing it up as a straight-up villain. And I, I absolutely love it. Rain would end up uh, later on working on films like uh, or TV shows like uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And, uh, as well as The Last Unicorn. Uh, actually, a lot of Kong guys worked on The Last Unicorn. You had Rain as, uh, the cat character, and you had Jeff Bridges as, uh, Prince Lair. Which I think is kind of cool. Again, the scene right out of the original, where they find the necklace. When Jeff Bridges actually got the part, uh, he did it because he was a fan of the original, and, like, he would actually end up, like, as a kid, he would, uh, fake, like, being sick so he could watch it on television. So he's a real admirer of the original, and I guess he took it as a way of saying, hey, it'd be cool to, you know, uh, make a movie based on my favorite film. 
And here we come on the sacrifice scene. Uh, this scene was, um, they shot this for, I believe, about a week, actually. I'm not too sure. Um, the dances, the, the choreography is amazing. Um, the natives look great. Dwan looks great. The, um, the music by John Barry is fantastic. It gives an eerie mood. Like, you know some bad shit's gonna happen. <laughs> And, and as you can see, yes, they did drug Dwan in this entire sequence, and so she almost, like, I imagine when she first sees Kong, it's very, like, she's hallucinating, she's seeing something more horrifying, which I think is actually more scary. <laughs> the scene actually took a while to shoot as well, because, um, actually there was a point where some of the natives ended up, uh, a lot of them were doing drugs at the time, because again, 70s, this was at the time when, you know, the hippie movement and, and the, the drugs were everywhere, and um, some of the natives ended up getting so stoned that they ended up, uh, some of them ended up walking out of the back lot and using their spears to fight off cars and everything, which must have been a fucking hilarious ride at the time. It was also um, bone-chillingly cold these nights when they were shooting. So all the natives, uh, the actors had to, um, extras had to gather together by the fire pits to stay warm. Uh, it's very much like how they shot Congo 5, where it was like so cold when they were shooting outside that they had to offer hot chocolate and keep everybody warm at the time. Actually, we should turn uh, the uh, commentary back to Dido De Laurentiis to talk about what it was like to uh, shoot the sequence. This sequence without the call. Cost around three, four million dollars. Without the, without, without Kong? the Kong, without taking any consideration how much Kong cost, because for four, five weeks every night in Los Angeles, night finish around eleven o'clock, because you have no possibility to go with yeah. too much noise, you know. And you start seven o'clock until eleven, and you're able to stop with the crowd, with dance, with the playback, with the music, which is a big wall. The big wall you just saw cost one million dollars to set, only to set. I do like the idea of how the gates open uh, with the lock due to the oil, and that's what the natives use it for, is to uh, slide the lock in and out and get the gates to open. I think that's really cool. And here we come to the altar, which was, again, shot on the same location at the wall at the MGM back lot. This was actually also, uh, I believe, the first thing they did with uh, the uh, Kong animatronics was this scene as well. It just looked like a lot of the um, the actors and cast and crew were having like such a fun time on this movie. It, even though they were again rushing for Christmas, they um, it looks like they really had a lot of fun working on it. Makes me wonder whatever happened to a lot of the natives, actors, and everything after this movie was done. That that'd be interesting to find out. I also love the lighting on the film with the. Um, the native torches and everything. I think that that looks really well done. So here they go. They're gonna sacrifice Kong or sacrifice Dwan to Kong, which is um, gonna be really uh, spectacular. It's gonna look really, really good. I, I just think overall the wall, it, this is the definitive Kong wall to me. I mean, I, mean, I know usually they have a stone wall, but uh, in this case they used a, a wooden wall uh, made out of trees. And actually the wall, was made, it was made out of um, several tree posts and everything and then strung together with a lot of uh, supplies. These shots here of the uh, crew coming in were supposed to be shot at Cathedral Beach, but instead they shot it on the uh, uh, California coastline, uh, California beaches. In, I believe, Los Angeles, they, they shot a lot of this, uh, of the crew growing in the rescue, uh, Duan. And here comes Kong. Now, uh, usually in the original film they used a, a gong to awaken Kong, and this one they use horns, and I think that's also an interesting, uh, twist, a different way to, uh, summon the beast himself. 
these shots here with uh, Dwan on the altar and Kong coming in are so iconic in terms of uh, Kong himself and the lore of the lore of the character. Actually, uh, while we're here, here comes Kong, and I think the best person to talk about him at the moment is uh, Rick Baker, who played him in the who played Kong in the suit. So here's Rick Baker to talk about how he uh, got the job. Well, I had actually heard from Landis that they were going to remake King Kong, and I said to John, "They're probably going to get some idiot and put him in a gorilla suit." And I was right. <laughs> I was like, you know, and I, I mean, I just said, I can't believe they're trying to remake this movie, and you know, and but then somehow they got my name and they talked to me, and I said, well, if you really are serious, I, I got to know really soon, or I'm going to uh, be on this other project. And they didn't call me right away. I took the other project, then they called me, and then I thought, well, maybe I can really bring something to it. The fact that I've so into gorillas, you know, maybe I can, I, I can add something, make it a little more real, and, and talk him into doing it right. I went and met with him, and I brought gorilla heads that I'd made and little sculptures of gorillas and all kinds of gorilla stuff and, and talked to them and eventually ended up getting the job to work on the film. And they were looking for somebody stupid enough to, to put the suit on. And, and I said, I'm stupid enough. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Kong's first appearance with Rick Baker in the suit, I think it looks really spectacular. It looks like um, they really did a lot of a really good job on this scene. Also, the first appearance of uh, Carlo Rambaldi's animatronics, the great Carlo Rambaldi who did the uh, work for E.T., Alien, and Close Encounters. And uh, this first shot of Kong, they actually, I believe, tried to film this real time as they were shooting the sacrifice scene in the back lot. They were shooting the ape suit stuff. The shot here is just a Kalang on the blue screen with the altar and Kong placed in the background. Uh, this here with the natives and Kong is a split screen shot where they shoot two different elements and splice them together. I believe these shots actually came out really well, in my opinion, on the film. And Kong looks ferocious, of course. And then here come the ape hands. Uh, it's interesting how these turned out. Uh, they're, they were the first time really using hydraulic kind of uh, equipment in a film like this. So the uh, they had a skeletal armature in the hands, and uh, then they would uh, cover it in, I believe, foam or fur or whatever, and uh, and then put some latex skin and then add some fur on top of that and that's how you get the hands. And most of the time, Lang was in the hands of Kong on blue screen for uh, most of the shooting with her in the hands. And then of course Kong leaves. So again, split screen shot with the natives and Kong really well done. Kong, Rick Baker on a miniature set, jungle set. One of the interesting things about this film is that uh, apparently Gullerman and uh, De Laurentiis, uh, they were known to be really like good friends and everything, but at times they like they really got e at each other's throats on this production, and um, they they had a couple of shouting matches and everything. There were times like where Gullerman quit and then would come back. Um, there were times where he wanted to get a right shot and De Laurentiis would argue with him. There there was a lot of arguments on the set. And here come the here come the sailors to come save the day, but they're already too late in saving uh, Dwan. Jeff Bridges as well. Uh, he did all his own stunts um, in this film, so he ended up climbing everything, he, climbing, jumping, running, did a lot of that stuff himself. Apparently, when they were shooting the scene where they were coming down the the hill shooting at the natives, um, apparently it was a bit of a hassle because like the. It was really steep, and it was hard to keep balance on the concrete uh, set. So um, there were times where they'd probably trip or something as they were coming down, so they had to be super careful, especially Charles Grodin in those uh, shoes he was wearing. A lot of this was shot at night, of course, um, to get the mood and everything for the scene.
I love the jungles of Skull Island in this movie. I think they actually, um, they, they're they really, really cool. Like, some of it's um, inside a soundstage, other times it's actually shot on Kauai, but it all matches up really well. I love this line that Jeff gives. <laughs> the irony of it. And then Groon steps into the footprint, which is um, also an iconic thing of Kong, is the footprint that they find um, and to match the size of Kong. This scene here with the trees knocked down, um, apparently this was after um, a storm apparently hit and uh, knocked down a whole bunch of trees on Kauai. So um, the crew saw these trees and thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we shot it where it looked like Kong had just wrecked through these trees on his way through? So they shot this whole sequence with uh, the, camp, the camp scene, as I call it, um, where they uh, saw like Kong's destruction, and it really went well with the fact that these trees were knocked down. Camp scenes with uh, Charles Grodin on the beach and everything, I believe, was shot in California, the night shots. Um, all the day shots were shot in Kauai, and the night shots were in California. Um, that was due to the surf being really bad on the beaches at Cathedral Beach, so they had to shoot the rest in California. scene here with uh, Fred finding out the size of Kong. And it's a kind of cool, a cool scene. It just kind of measures out beast to man, how high Kong is. And in this film, he's, I believe, 45 feet tall. Um, I made the mistake in my review of making it where he was 50 feet tall. Um, so in, in this case, he actually is about 40. I mean, they say his footprint was like 8 foot 5 inches. Multiply that by 8 uh, for you fans if you want to calculate that. Of course, Fred thinking the idea of maybe, hmm, maybe capturing Kong would be better than oil. This camp scene, I believe, was shot in Kauai, out in the forest, in the jungles. The guy who plays Cardaham, I think, is a really great actor. I think he passed away, um, uh... About a year ago, actually, which is sad because he, he seems like a really cool guy, really nice actor. I actually like this scene for how they were able to um, talk about how, like, is this ape gonna, like, it's like some weird concept of the ape marrying the girl, um, which is odd for a lot of people, and I think it gives a lot more mystery to Kong. Now we're coming up to the Glade scene. This shot was actually Rick Baker on the main miniature set as Kong, and then he would pan, uh, come up, and that cave with Dwan is actually a miniature projection. Yes, they actually did use miniature projection, like in the original, for a lot of shots on this movie. And uh, Jessica Lang here was shot, um, they filmed this stuff at the back lot, uh, or not in the back lot, on the sound stages, um, with the mechanical hand, and it would intercut with Rick Baker on the miniature set. Rick Baker actually, um, uh, I think, re did a really good job on the ape suit. Uh, the suit itself uh, was actually a combination of Red Baldy and uh, and Rick Baker. Uh, a lot of it was shot, um, or like a lot of it was um, essentially like mechanical by the like the mechanical masks for Kong, like the mechanical movements of how the facial features work on Kong were actually done with like bicycle. Uh, kind of mechanisms to make it move around and everything in wire. And he would put the mask on and the wires would be fed, fed through the back of uh, the suit and it would go underneath the feet and feed through to the uh, to the puppeteers who were doing the, the mask movements. Kong also, um, Rick Baker also had arm extensions, like semi-arm extensions. He wanted to walk on all fours like an actual gorilla, but he, the De Laurentiis wanted a, uh, a basic, you know, bipedal uh, character, so uh, he came up with these arm extensions that make them a little long, make the arms a little longer. Of course, the hand, uh, mechanical hands by Carlo Rimbaldi on the set here were really well done. 
This is also uh, blue screen shots with uh, Rick Baker on a blue screen matched with uh, Lang on the soundstage. Uh, interesting thing to know, uh, Kong's vocals were provided by Peter Cullen, who you guys might know as uh, Optimus Prime in the Transformers movies and uh, original cartoon show. Uh, apparently when he was doing the vocal recordings, uh, he only did very little. Um, well, he, he got most of it done, but what happened was his voice kind of got uh, messed up and he uh, ended up coughing up blood. And it's funny, I met with Peter Cullen and talked to him about it, and um, he, he didn't really seem wanting to talk about it, because it was really painful for, for him to do this uh, a whole movie. The shot is Jessica Lang on uh, blue screen running away with uh, miniature Kong, and then the hand comes in to pick her up. Uh, when they were with uh, the hands themselves, uh, there were times where Jessica Lang was actually really uncomfortable. Um, in the hands because there were times that gave her bruises and everything uh, while they were shooting. And all this is blue screen with uh, Lang in the hand uh, interacting with like nothing. She had nothing to act to so she had to focus on like something up on the roof of the stage when they were shooting. Uh, the stunt lady who was per who was uh, doing uh, stuff for her when they were doing the test shots to figure out how it was going to work um, she ended, like, what happened was the hand, at one point, she was in, the, the stunt lady was in the hand, and apparently the hand broke, and she almost got crushed, uh, by the hand, but luckily she survived, uh, that ordeal with the, with the hand itself. When they were trying to figure out, uh, this was the first time a lot of blue screen compositing was used, and this was before Star Wars, like a year, like a few months before Star Wars came out. And they had no idea how the results were going to turn out, so what they actually did was they came up with a way of first time using, like, VHS or beta to uh, look at the shots and then match it with a video editor on set to see how the shots came out. And that's how a lot how they were able to check the shots immediately to make sure it was corrected. Because uh, they were using a lot of blue screen. There was no green screen. Love it was blue screen. And a lot of the... They had to make sure the lighting was matching up and... Lang's blonde hair apparently was a problem. Lang here was punching uh, the big Kong, the big animatronic Kong that they uh, built for the movie that cost a shit ton of money. And um, they ended up uh, only using for a brief moment because it kept breaking down. But anyway, so like the blue screen was a huge problem apparently because of the lighting and everything and you can't have blue on blue screen or else it'll bleed through. And you can tell in a couple shots where the blue screen lighting is at, um, but at the time, this was pretty impressive. This shot here was obviously on Time Magazine without the background. If you ever get the Time Magazine, that shot uh, is really famous. I do like the whole idea that Dwan's able to figure out the sign of Kong with, uh, you know, Libra or Aquarius or whatever. Uh, I think that's kind of cool. Um, interesting way to connect the two. The hands always... I love the way the hands look. Actually, one of the hands does still survive. I believe it's that hand there. Um, it's actually in Italy right now, and it's it's in a warehouse somewhere because uh, Carlo Rambaldi, after his work on a lot of films, uh, opened up a museum, and uh, he ended up uh, showcasing a lot of his props and everything from his films, including the mechanical hand from this movie. And at some point down the line, the museum closed down in around the early 90s. And uh, But recently, the, uh, the hand was discovered in a warehouse in the museum, or like in a storage area in the museum. And there's plans to reopen it in Italy to, uh, to continue the legacy of Rimbaldi's work. So they... Uh, there was a photo that just came up of the hand, and it's in pretty good condition. It just needs a few bits of stitching, but it's still around if you look into it. Jessica Lang had to do the mud trip a couple of times, and uh, ended up uh, tripping a few times uh, when they were shooting it. Uh, they, I think they had to do about five takes on that fall. Now we're back to Kauai. Um in the island of Kauai with the crew looking for Kong. Um, these shots are actually really nice. I really like this whole sequence where they take a break and figure out what they're going to do. I 
Well, I do like also the idea that they have flares to mark where they are so the crew know where the rest of the crew at the beach and everything know where they are on the island. Again, the fog um, that was shot in, uh, around the coastline that they had to use the fog machines for. And then on the day scenes with the camp scene, we're uh, back to uh, Cathedral Beach. Um, I love how snarky Fred is in this scene. He's just got a back massager. It just shows how much of an asshole he is in this entire movie. This whole scene is great, too, because it just shows the tension that Jack's intention is to save Dwan, while Fred's intention is to mark the island and find oil, and it just shows the conflict between the two characters. And I love the rivalry overall in this entire movie, how they um, interact. Here's uh, Jack flipping his shit. I do like the um, this scene here with uh, him and Bo. It's really nice. Now we're coming on to one of the best scenes in the movie, in my opinion. This is uh, the waterfall scene. Um, this is a beautiful se sequence uh, put together by the visual effects company and everything. Uh, actually, I want to turn this bit over to Dino De Laurentiis to discuss uh, the waterfall scene um, and how they uh, shot that. Well, this is waterfall. You know, the sequence of waterfall. This is one of the most poetic scenes for me in the movie. When the Kong really comes in love with the girl and he realizes she's very dirty in the mud, you know, then he takes the girl, he puts in the waterfall. Incidentally, this waterfall we shot in Brazil. These are the big waterfall in the world from Mato Grosso in Brazil. Yeah. Or it was very difficult the sequence to do it. Then he take Kong, take the girl, put it under the water, then he send in the water, and then when he, the girl come out in his hand, he start to what do you say in English? Uh, blow, blow, blow dry. And uh, because the Kong cannot talk, he wants to say to the girl, I love you, but he cannot tell the girl. He was, <laughs> he was in the right position to talk. And this is really very touching, but very difficult scene to do. One of the most difficult sequences to do it. This whole sequence is great. Um, one of the interesting things about this scene is that the uh, animatronic hand that had to go in water, the effects crew were so concerned that the latex and everything was going to tore or tear and that the, um, the, it was going to break down because water and animatronics don't go so well. But it came out actually really well. It was actually, um, the, the hand didn't break or anything. So Jessica Lang was shot um, soundstage on this cliff face with the pool of water. All this was uh, shot on the soundstage and came out really well. And Baker, of course, was on blue screen with the uh, waterfall shot in Brazil. It's interesting because the guy who shot the scene, the waterfall stuff, um, he actually, when he, sh when he went to shoot it, he was, m he was gone for like, like he was unheard of for like a couple weeks and everybody was concerned what happened to him. But luckily he came back, uh, unscathed and survived. And, uh, he apparently, um, just came out with some amazing footage. This, in my opinion, is uh, Roy Bagley, the character's best moment in the in the scene. Um, I think it's uh, a really great sequence for him. He's just playing up the laughs. I believe that's a Jack Daniels. Also, he's drinking, which I I think Jack Daniels had a huge uh, sponsorship with the movie because they came out with some sort of King Kong drink. There's an ad for it. Um, if you look into it, there's an ad for Jack Daniels King Kong uh, related drink. In fact, there is a bit of product placement in this movie. You know, Shell, Exxon, Jack Daniels, Nikon. There's a bit of that in this movie, surprisingly. I believe the surf was really bad when they were shooting this bit, as you saw when they immediately cut to Fred going, oh, I'm crazy, eh? Um, the surf ended up starting to flood the set. 
So I think they had to like cut a few times, but they carried on with the scene anyway. Now we're coming on to the log scene. This is an iconic moment in any Kong film. Uh, this was a built set on a soundstage. Uh, the log was built on a gimbal so it could roll around. And of course Kong was on the miniature set um, and composited with blue screenshots. And a lot of those guys um, ended up uh, becoming blue screen when they fell into the cliff. And surprisingly no spider pit. Um, instead there's like a river below but they easily could have fallen because they're on the sure side of the mountain. And a lot of people complain about this set looking really fake. Um, I actually really like it. I think it's a different atmosphere. It's like something out of um, The Land That Time Forgot or Alan Irwin, Irwin Allen's The Lost World. I think, it, I think it looks really cool. I mean, obviously the mountains in the background are painted, and there's the cliff set and everything. Uh, when the actors fell, they actually uh, fell on mats, of course, because they didn't want to get hurt. Um, and then the overhead shots with them, with the cliff below, a lot of that was blue screen over the log. I love that jump scare, too. I think that really helped the fright of make Kong scary, was that jump cut to, or that jump scare to make him look really ferocious. Jeff Bridges on blue screen, again, doing his own stunts. I think now we're going to turn it over to Rick Baker to talk about, uh, what it was like working with Carl Rambaldi and working on the suit. When I came back, I kind of said, we want you and Carlo Rombaldi to work together, which I didn't like the idea. I thought actually Carlo was talented and did some interesting things, you know, but it's hard to have two bosses, you know. The scene is actually really, really cool. Um, obviously the big foot of Kong and the shots with Jeff Bridges. And of course the actors falling to their doom. But yeah, I believe they were on, some of them were on harnesses and some of them weren't, so they had to like jump off. So a lot of this is a lot of blue screen compositing added in later. Of course, uh, Bone survives. A great actor, by the way, who plays him. This scene with uh, Kong uh, trying to grab Jack. Um, Jeff Bridges was in a cave, and then they would uh, bring in the uh, miniature, hand, the, the mechanical hand that would come in and try to grab him. Um, and on the miniature stage, it was using uh, some sort of uh, they were going to use front uh, uh, miniature projection, but it ended up not coming out too well. So instead, they just put a blue screen on the little cave area and added Jeff Bridges in later, um, which is interesting because uh, in the original they used uh, uh, rear. Uh, front screen projection to uh, make that scene where Kong grabs them and they did it frame by frame. Uh, De La Rentes had actually asked Jim Danforth uh, to animate a scene in which Kong fights a monster, but of course Jim refused because he didn't. He was with Universal and they were kind of uh, almost burning bridges at the time. So no stop motion was used in this film. In the concept art for the sequence, uh, Dwan was actually on some sort of nest on a rock face, and she was supposed to be in the sequence, but um, apparently they cut it out and just left it with the actors themselves. It's good that Bone actually survived, because in the original they'd have Carl go back and explain what happened, um, and obviously Fred isn't with them, so they had to get uh, Bone to do it. Um, so that's why he survives, apparently. And then we have the scene, the drop-off scene, where the plane comes in and, uh, drops off cargo for the crew. This scene was actually longer than the extended cut, um, well, about a minute longer, actually. Um, it's well shot. Um, apparently they, when they were shooting this scene, the ship was there, and all the crew were there, and they were waiting for the plane to come in, and the plane would not take off. Apparently there was a huge delay and uh, they spent a whole day waiting for this thing and it never showed up so it was wasting a whole day's worth of filming I think the plane had a jet fuel problem or something the whole barrel thing reminds me of Jaws and there's a lot of uh, Jaws in this movie as uh, Lorenzo said before um, because Dino was trying to compete with Jaws he was trying to make a movie bigger than Jaws 
This is actually the uh, tractor in the background. Uh, they couldn't get the tractor on the set, so they built like a plywood uh, 2D version of that tractor um, to uh, basically replace the actual tractor that they couldn't get on the set. Again, Charles Grodin chewing up scenery whenever he can, and he's a gr I wish he would come back into acting, I wish he would do more and everything. In fact, like, all the actors, I would love to see them come in for, like, a Kong reunion panel uh, to talk about the movie in general and uh, what it was like to shoot this movie. These shots of uh, Jeff Bridges uh, climbing up the mountain. Uh, these were shot, I think, on a day um, where uh, they just had Jeff Bridges and stuff go through. And this was after the storm, too, so like a lot of it was really muddy and stuff, and Jeff Bridges had a hard time climbing that mountain face. Again, shot on the MGM back lot um, with uh, the wall and everything, which is really great. And uh, this, th I like this conflict with uh, Captain Ross and Fred because um, it just shows how crazy Fred's getting in uh, wanting to get what he wants. Yep, zero craps given about any of the crew. <laughs> this is until Bone shows up. Bone. Bone. Now we're moving on to the uh, Kong's Lair, the whole sequence with the snake and everything. Um, this scene is actually really, um, it, it looks really cool, like the set, the miniature set looks nice, um, the ape suit looks great, and the snake fight happens. Um, I think the person we should, uh, go back to is Rick Baker to talk about, um, what it was, uh, talking about making Kong's design and, uh, building the suit in general. When I went in and talked to him originally, they wanted King Kong to be like a Neanderthal man not even a gorilla, and I was going, how can you, that you can't do that. They actually gave me these drawings of this primitive man and said, we want you to build, we think you both have good ideas, you know, we want you to build this, and Carlo's going to build one, and we're going to compare. So I threw the drawings out and built a gorilla suit. <laughs> you know, and I, go, I was 25 years old, you know, and, and I said, you know, I'm going to show these guys they don't know what they're talking about, you know. I haven't changed much, I guess. <laughs> After they had tried several other actors and, and, and things, I, in, in the meantime, was building a test costume to do some film tests with and that I built it to fit myself. When I put the suit on and they started shooting some tests, they were furious because it looked nothing like what they'd given me to do. But I go, yeah, but this is better. <laughs> you know, this guy in this gorilla suit going, this is better. All yeah, your humor. Right. Yeah, you know, so a uh, long time later, Carlo finally got his first, like, test suit kind of thing done more along the lines of what they asked for and John Gilliman said no this is he, he was right this is the way we should go yeah I mean that's what I found so disappointing too about it was that I had a very definite idea on how to make a gorilla suit and was kind of not allowed to make the suit that I wanted to do I wanted it to be a real gorilla I mean and a walk quadruped and, and, and they didn't want that they wanted a Hollywood you know biped this sequence was uh, shot, of course, it, it is iconic um, in terms of the 76 Kong. Uh, Will Shepard, in a lot of the shots with uh, Kong looking over, over the shoulder at Lang, uh, that was actually Will Shepard, um, who was the stunt guy for Kong. And uh, whenever Rick Baker was either tired or he couldn't do a stunt scene, uh, Basically, Will would take over, and if you guys ever get a chance, uh, there's a great book Will wrote about uh, his experience making the film with some rare photos and everything. It's definitely worth a read on uh, what it took to make to uh, shoot the film and be in the ape suit. It goes into a lot of detail. Now we're on to the snake fight. 
Um, this scene, apparently when they were shooting, was a real nightmare. They had built a couple snakes, a rail snake that could move around, uh, and then they built, like, one that would move its head, and, uh, one for Kong to fight. Um, apparently what happened was, when they were shooting this, uh, the snake looked so bad that they had to, like, wait to figure out how to fix it. Um, there were several attempts to f say, what do we do about the scene? What, like, what, how do we, how are we able to shoot it? Because it's such a pain in the ass, because the snake's not working. Um, well, one of the, uh, suggestions they made was to shoot it with a little a little person in a, a stunt suit fighting a real boa constrictor. Um, that was one of the suggestions they made, but, uh, unfortunately they didn't do that. Probably for safety reasons. Uh, but instead they shot it in a lot of, uh, close-ups. Again, the extended cut has a couple, like, actually is a bit longer with the sequence, and it actually shows uh, some better shots in the movie. Um, it's worth uh, checking out if you ever find uh, a copy of it. Uh, again, Will Shepard did the majority of the sequence in the, in the suit, um, but Rick Baker, I think, did most of the close-ups. And another bit from Kong is him ripping the jaws of some sort of creature. In the extended cut with this shot, uh, there was a much better shot where he pounded his chest. I don't know why they didn't use that shot. The sequence coming up where uh, Jack and Dwan uh, jump off the cliff uh, was a very dangerous shot. Uh, they obviously used stunt people to do, the, to do the, the jump off the cliff, but what happened was when they did the jump, um, they were supposed to land on a huge, like, mat, like a huge, like, inflatable mat that would, uh, break the fall. Uh, but unfortunately, the, um, when they fell and they went straight for the mat, they went behind the mat on the cliff face, and everybody feared the worst that they had, uh, gotten killed. Uh, but luckily they survived. Uh, it was surprisingly no injuries whatsoever, just maybe a bruise or two. Um... Actually, uh, when Jeff and Dwan, or Jeff and uh, Jessica did the shot where they first jump, um, what happened was he they let they landed, but Jessica landed on Jeff's groin, which oh my, which had to have been hysterical. I mean, poor Jeff had to endure the pain of that, you know. <laughs> but um, unfor but apparently he made it through, and he um, they went through the rest of the movie. I do like the idea of how they were able to capture Kong with uh, this trap. Um, it, it lacks the, uh, the the adventure of the original where you know Kong rampages through the um, the, the village, but um, it makes up for it with the uh, inclusion of him just breaking the shit out of that wall. The scene was again longer in the extended cut. Um, there's a bit here with Jack and Dwan where they talk, where she says, "You know, have a drink with me at the Brown Derby," um, and, and it still uh, adds a bit more dialogue between the two. Something out of like a freaking bodyguard. <laughs> I love uh, Barry's score in this sequence. It really kicks in like the intensity of the sequence itself. And yay, they made it out in time. So this sequence is actually, I think, really intense. It, it really um, builds up suspense and everything. Like, you know Kong's coming. but And they have to be quick about uh, getting them, uh, Dwan and Jack, back inside.
course, Kong's coming in now to uh, break some shit. Um, this sequence actually, I think, l looks really great. It's all, it was all they originally wanted to shoot Kong in slow mo for a lot of the movie to match it up with like stuff like Godzilla, where they would shoot a guy in a suit and then uh, slow it down to make him look bigger. Um, but Gullerman said he wanted to shoot most of the Kong in uh, full 24 frames a second, which is what they uh, actually did go through. Seen here, Kong is walking on a treadmill on a blue screen with the background shot um, on the set. And then here comes the mechanical hand coming in to grab the wall. Again, the extended cut, it is the scene is a lot longer, but it shows some more cool shots of him breaking through. Um, a lot of this was uh, shot with Rick in the suit, um, although Will Shepard did the actual break through the gate um, when they shot it. Uh, Rick Baker, um, when he was in, when both of them were in the suit, the way it worked was that they'd have to wear a muscle suit underneath. That was the first thing they did, was wear a muscle suit, and um, the uh, jiggling of the suit with the with the pecs and the stomach and everything, they would fill the suit up with uh, with uh, watered filled condoms, <laughs> surprisingly, and that would give more muscle to the character, and then they would put. Um, the, the skin pieces on, and then the fur suit on top of that, which was made, I believe, out of bear skin, which uh, Baker disagreed with, but Rimbaldi turned him over with the with the bear skin. And then uh, they would wear, you know, black makeup around the eyes, and then eventually uh, would wear contact lenses, which really caused a lot of, like, their eyes to strain out and, like, be really painful for them. And then the mask would go on top. And here is Will Shepard. Um, great shot, Will Shepard breaking through the wall. And then this bit where he uh, falls through the pit. Uh, he did a couple of takes on this sequence, and uh, obviously the last take is what they used here, where he falls uh, forward. And it's interesting here, with this shot, where he's raising up and then he slams his fist down, apparently he did the scene... And he got up, and then Gullman called cut, and everybody thought, and he thought, oh no, I ruined the shot. And then he, out of frustration, just slams his fist. He's like, oh, I messed up the shot. And then it turned out they used that shot where he gets, where Will actually got frustrated because he thought he ruined the take. And uh, that's the scene, that's the shot that's used in the movie. So it's funny how, like, a blooper ends up in the film itself. And then you have the mechanical hand. Uh, interesting thing, I believe in this sequence when they were shooting it, the mechanical guys were messing around with the hand, and they made the hand do the middle finger, but it ended up freezing that position. It got broken and it froze in that position, so for a lot of them it was a big, you know, oops, uh-oh uh kind of thing, which I thought was, um, I think it's kind of funny. Then you have the natives uh, praying to their fallen god. Now, uh, the super tanker bit. Um, this whole sequence was... Um, the tanker was actually loaned um, from an oil shipment. And uh, what they had to do was go out to sea and clean the entire ship. Because they were going to use camera equipment. And they didn't want the oil and everything and the tanks and everything to spark a fire. So they had to go clean it out. And they filmed it. I believe for about a week they filmed the entire super tanker sequence um, with uh, the cast and everything. Although Kong was shot later in um, at the sound stages with a miniature tank. One interesting fact was that um, when Gullerman when they were when Gullerman was directing and he wanted to steer the ship in terms of a set course. Um, they ended up going into some sort of un, uh, some sort of restricted waters that was from another country, and uh, everybody was scared that Gullerman was going to send them into enemy waters, but uh, luckily he didn't, and uh, they carried on shooting. I really like 
like this sequence. I think it just shows the conflict and consequence between the two characters, uh, or the three characters in this case, because, like, obviously Fred wants to, like, exploit Kong and make millions of dollars. Uh, Dwan is all about being a star, but she's conflicted with Kong because of their relationship. And then, you know, Jack is all like, do I want to be a part of it? Do I not want to be a part of it? There's a lot of conflict in this whole sequence. I think during when they were shooting this, uh, before they shot this, uh, Jeff Bridges got sick at one point, so they had to stop shooting uh, during uh, when he, while he was sick. While uh, Peter Cullen did do the roars of uh, and the growls of Kong, um, a lot of uh, the, the roar of Kong himself was done with a uh, uh, stock dinosaur roar that was used in other films like uh, The Land Unknown, uh, Duel, and even Spielberg's Jaws. Uh, was used. The same roar was used over and over again. It's a stock roar you could probably find in any sound effects library. Well, Baker did most of the ape suit work. He unfortunately didn't get really zero credit. I mean, he got a contribution credit at the end, but um, Rimbaldi and everybody got all the Oscar nods, which I, I feel bad for Baker for, because he did a spectacular job as Kong and uh, all the work he put into the suit and everything. I love this whole bit, how they explain how, like, the, what happens to the natives after their god was taken. Um, it's an interesting, uh, interesting uh, theory on what happens to them. Uh, this is the conflict bit I was talking about. Um, it's really well done, and the actors do a really good job. Now we're cutting to uh, the sequence with uh, Dwan and Kong's ultimate reunion when she falls into the, the crater, the, the cage. Uh, this scene also uh, had several takes in the extended cut. This was um, this had an alternate version in in that in that version, <laughs> and um, it was a lot slower and everything. And there were more shots of Kong, of course. I think we're going to turn it over now to uh, Dino De Laurentiis, who at the time of Kong's release uh, talked about how like he wanted uh, Kong himself to get an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. So fantastic in the way in the way he acted with his eyes, with all his face. I already suggest two months ago, Kong must have an Academy nomination for one of the Best Actor of the Year. So like I said, there were times when uh, this movie had an extensive budget. I think the budget ended up being $25 million, if not more, which today would be like a $250 million movie. This scene here, um, with this jump cut, there was a whole bit in, again, extended version, where um, after Cog sniffs the, uh, the scarf and goes on a fit and everything, there were more shots of that cut to Dwan saying, oh, he's hurting himself, and he, she would, and Jeff would, con, Jack would continue to try to lure her in, but eventually she's like, no, I want to go help, I want to go help him, you know, he's, he's having a meltdown. Mm -hmm. 
Baker, I believe, did the majority of uh, this sequence, um, where Kong's flipping out and having his uh, his primal rage, per se. Um, although I think Will Shepard later on did the jump where he tries to catch uh, Dwan. Great use of sound effects here with uh, the pipe and uh, Kong's rampage. Well, the sound work is really good on this movie. I think now, actually, we should turn it to Dilo Dorantes to talk about um, the budget of the film and uh, what it's like to uh, go over budget on a film like this. It's not the first time uh, in my life I make so big a movie. I remember in 1952, when I did War and Peace with Audrey Hepburn and Harry Fonda, I spent in 52, six million dollars. Six million dollars in 52 is like 25 million dollars today. And when in 1962 I did the Bible, the Bible directed by John Huston, so big a star, we spent in 62 17 million dollars. I don't know, maybe today it's 30 million dollars. Mm. You know, you cannot make this calculation because we must be a little crazy. I must be honest. In, in movie business, we must be a little crazy, but crazy in different way, not in a uh, realistic way. You understand yeah. what I mean? Crazy in take some decisions to believe in what you got to do it, to, to believe to make a family entertainment with Kong, you can spend $24 million. The money, it can come back or not. But this is not the point, because with some picture you can lose the money, other picture you can have a profit. Yeah. So our satisfaction to have people like you say, Dino, I love Kong. This whole scene is actually really well done. And then here's uh, Will Shepard doing the jump. And this bit with Lang getting caught by Kong, that was done on blue screen where she was on wires and uh, would be caught by the mechanical hand. The shots in this actually came out really well, I think. With, uh, of course, Lang on a blue screen, interacting with nothing, and Rick Baker in the miniature set. I also love this bit here with Fred Wilson, how he looks at Kong and Duani. It's just, he looks disgusted. But he's like, ew, no, no, I don't, I don't like ape girl romance. <laughs> then Lang on a tank set with uh, the big Kong legs and the mechanical hand. The big Kong was actually um, a huge um, thing. Uh, mostly for publicity, um, they wanted to do a full-size Kong that would walk around and everything and do the majority of the work, and uh, Carlo Rambaldi and the crew uh, did build one, but unfortunately, it um, they wanted to go to like an airplane company to build it, but they said it would take like three years, which they did not have the time for, so instead they just built it out of like different uh, ideas of um, hydraulics and everything. And when they shot it, obviously it didn't it didn't work too well. It kept breaking down. It was more like a giant mannequin of Kong, if anything. It wasn't really much in terms of animatronics. Um, although when it worked, it worked. But most of the time, uh, it kept breaking down, especially during the presentation scene. So uh, for later shots, uh, they would just um, use uh, the legs and the hands and everything uh, for certain shots in the movie. The scene is also great, too, because it's almost like Kong is letting Duan go, you know? He, know he he knows, you know, like, he almost feels like they can't be together, but he can't, he can't really help himself. He really loves this woman, and he's just, he's letting himself go. He's, uh, he's basically almost broken. He's a broken king, and Duan does feel bad, but she's, oh, she's just overwhelmed. Like, she doesn't want this poor guy to be exploited, but... Hey, if it makes her a star, it, does, it makes her a star. Let's bring in Jeff Bridges to talk about the Beauty and the Beast aspect. You almost believe that the that, that big, huge monkey was real. You know the way she uh, had so much uh, conviction.
These shots here of the fourth of the whole uh, celebration of Kong. This was shot on the fourth of July weekend. The second unit stayed and uh, filmed this whole bit in New York. Uh, the parade sequence. Uh, this was shot in, I believe, in California, and um, with actually a matte shot uh, right about here that had uh, New York in the background. The sequence was actually shot in California in a hotel in Los Angeles. Um, they had to set up the entire sequence and uh, uh, build up uh, the flowers and everything. Uh, but when they, the first time they tried to shoot this, this is when Jeff Bridges was sick and he had the flu. So they had to cancel that and um, all the flowers actually went to all the... Uh, the crew, the crew ladies on on the movie and um, some of the offices at De Laurentiis and everything end up looking like a funeral wake <laughs> with all the flowers that had uh, gone out of use because they used real flowers on this uh, in the sequence. The scene was also had an extension with uh, more. Uh, conflicting decisions with Dwan deciding who to go for between Fred or Jack. And Jessica looks absolutely gorgeous in this sequence. If I was in Jessica Lang's uh, shoes in terms of her character being a star, I'd think, yeah, I, I, I'd want to stay. I'd want to be a star. Love the irony of the Empire State Building making a cameo in the film, whereas in the climax it's the World Trade Center. This was shot, um, I believe, in uh, on Long Island, um, Roosevelt Island, with uh, Jeff Bridges. Uh, obviously, by the bridge and everything, they shot that uh, in a few hours in a night. Uh, and then all this was California. This is back in California. Originally, they wanted to use a um, the uh, Yankee Stadium, and that didn't work out. And then they wanted to use other stadiums in New York. Uh, but what happened was the budget was going so high that they just couldn't use it, so they instead shot the whole thing in California. And the, the whole Petrox look and everything, that's just the wall and the altar repainted. I love Jessica Lange's uh, dress in the sequence. It's absolutely gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. Great costume. But yeah, the, the majority of this set was just the wall that they just repainted and everything and uh, just painted with glitter and silver. And out comes the, uh, the uh, big Kong, the big animatronic Kong. I think the people we should uh, bring in for this conversation is Rick Baker to uh, talk about the robot. I built this gorilla suit, came to the set, um, I said, where's Carlos? And he go, well, he's not, he, he didn't get a chance to finish because he's, he's going to build this 40-foot uh, robot that's going to do the whole movie, you know. And, I went, and they said, he's a genius, you know. I was going, he's a liar. He cannot build a 40-foot <laughs> robot, you know. It's, nobody's can do that. And uh, here's Dino De Laurentiis to talk about the robot. I must say, you know, we built this huge, fantastic uh, ape. It cost us $3 million. He holds now in Los Angeles. So this whole sequence, I think, actually came out really well, especially with Barry's score. Um, it is a little over the top with the giant gas uh, tank thing with Kong there. Uh, but this scene took forever to shoot because, like, the animatronic, again, wasn't working. This curtain thing, for example, had problems because it was lifted by helicopter. Actually, when uh, Jessica Lange, uh, when she uh, was in the helicopter coming down for the sequence, she actually ended up getting airsick, and they had to uh, take a minute to give her a rest to get better. Of course, Rick Baker on soundstage with the miniatures. And at times, yeah, the animatronic does work really well um, for the, the less screen time it has. Of course, uh, Fred Wilson with his ridiculous looking outfit. <laughs> Even, I mean, I, yeah, I agree that outfit's really, really ridiculous. Of course, uh, Kong breaks through, like in the original, breaks through his chains, which they never say are chrome steel in this one. Instead, it's... A 
apparently they asked for a lot of extras to come in to shoot this, um, and uh, a call went out uh, in the Los Angeles papers and everything for to come in and shoot. And a couple of nights they'd have a lot of people, a couple of nights they'd have a shit ton of people, and then other nights they'd have very little. Some of the shots here um, used a mix of uh, like split screen again with uh, the miniature Kong in the real set with the uh, extras. Actually, Kong's crown in this sequence ended up going on a auction site, a prop site, um, and was auctioned off. I don't know who got it, as well as one of the flag things. Now, everybody thinks that's uh, Faye Ray doing a cameo, um, which they actually were trying to get Faye Ray to do a cameo, but she decided uh, she never really responded to it at the time. Of course, they shot a lot of this, a lot of this scene in close-up. I think now what we should do is actually turn the commentary over to Charles Grodin, and he talks about how there was apparently an alternate ending to uh, Fred's demise. The only thing they changed in the movie is in the original version, King Kong missed me when he stepped on me. And the audience was so disappointed, they just groaned, they were so upset, so they re-edited it to make it look like he killed me. Originally, he wasn't supposed to kill me. Editing Kong was done by Ralphie Winters, who changed it where Fred gets killed and everything. And the editing is actually really spot on on this film. I, I, I think Ralph did a fantastic job. Uh, Ashley, we should uh, bring it over to uh, Dino Tolerantes to talk about uh, what it's like to edit a picture like Kong. When I start to make a movie, I have only one idea, to make it the best movie I can. When I start to think about to beat the Jules was when I finished the movie. When it was when I over. I see cut to the movie, the yeah. first, first print. I say, well, the picture come along in the way really I want to do it. Weeping, but I... Cry. But I must say, I work two years with this movie. I studying, I work in every frame. But when I see the final, at the end of the picture, cut together, I receive a shock too. Mm -hmm. And I come touching. A lot of this stuff in New York was shot in New York for real. Um, the elevated train scene with, uh, of course, here with uh, Jack and Dwan escaping into the city with the train, that was all shot for real. Um, there was a deleted scene where Jack tries to hotwire uh, one of the cars, and um, he, he can't do it. And then there's a whole scene that was cut out, which I feel was very unnecessary sorry, to cut out, was where Kong trashes some buildings and then takes a car and implodes it into a building. Like, why'd they cut that out? I have no idea. And then we come across the elevated train sequence. This is also iconic to Kong, like in the original. Uh, this is all miniature work. This is mostly just Rick Baker in a suit having fun on, uh, miniature, on a miniature train set. And actually, we should bring it over to Rick Baker to talk about uh, working on uh, the sequence. I mean, yeah, it was fun. It was cool to be the guy in the gorilla suit, even though it was hell, too, you know. But, right. I mean, you know, how many people get to, like, stomp around a miniature, you know, thing and blow have things blow up and break things and, and and do all that and it was kind of cool and this was a 25 million dollar movie which at the, you know I mean before the things I was working on were 25 thousand dollar <laughs> movies you know the sequence uh, this was actually the last bit shot uh, for Jeff Bridges was the whole uh, train inside the train getting uh, trashed which was on again on a gimbal set and uh, this was the last thing Jeff Bridges worked on in the movie. And uh, also in the sequence, when they had the scenes here where uh, Jack and Dwan go down um, below and escape the exploding train, they had built like a 2D version of the derailed train on its side, and it was blowing up and there was fire and everything, and that was causing concern for a lot of the neighbors on in, in, in the city at the time. And they had called the fire department and everything, and um, they had to make sure, no, 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 we're just shooting a movie, and that's all it really was. And Rick Baker here, actually, he was concerned that he was um, he was going to get caught on fire with the suit, and uh, luckily that didn't happen for him. 
believe a lot of these shots were done in, at the bridges in New York and uh, caused a lot of traffic problems when they were shooting. I love this shot here with uh, them escaping and the helicopter fly by. We're back to Kong on the miniature set. Um, I actually really like how the sets, the miniature sets and environment for the uh, New York scenes were really well put together. So props to the miniature department for doing that. And uh, this, of course, this whole bit where Kong escapes to the river, this is what would lead to the infamous confrontation ride at Universal Studios Florida. And, uh, of course, you can see my review on that. This was also shot in New York. Uh, there's a... I don't know where the location is uh, on memory, but uh, if I ever go back to New York, I'll definitely go check that area out where they shot this whole sequence. Which is right by an actual bar where I believe they shot inside the bar as well. I mean, it kind of makes sense, you know? Hey, this sucks, let's get a drink, you know? It, it, it makes sense for a story like this. And it gives it more realism. Of course, the World Trade Centers, um, sadly no longer with us. Um, but they're very well photographed in this film. And then this whole bar. This was, I think, an actual bar they shot in, in the movie. They, sh they, sh they shot a legit bar in New York. It's the same area. These scenes here with Kong um, in the water, he was shot, Rick Baker was in a tank um, in the MGM backlot, and um, he was really concerned that he was going to drown the suit. He had to put, like, like the suit was so heavy, he had to wear, um, like, kind of water weights or something, or, like, water inflatables to keep himself afloat, and they had divers in the tank to make sure he didn't drown. Baker had also, um, apparently... Well, in the suit had trouble breathing, so they'd have to put in a breathing straw uh, it hinged in between the mouth for him to uh, uh, get fresh air. But most of the time he was breathing in his own, uh, his own heat exhaustion, which must have been very uncomfortable for him. This scene is actually, I really like how this scene is, and it's, it's really sweet, it's really well shot, very beautiful uh, photograph-wise. And of course, actually, th there was an extension of this scene as well, um, which had uh, Dwan trying to pursue Jack to kiss him, or to kiss her, and um, Jeff and Jack says, "You know, I can't afford to get hung up on a rising star." And um, again, this is some of the character development I wish wasn't cut out entirely from the theatrical version. Now we're coming on to the electrical uh, uh, electricity sequence. Um, this scene, apparently Baker was so concerned he was going to get shocked because he was soaked and wet and they had like the uh, pyrotechnics go off. And again, this scene was actually a lot longer in the extended cut, which is, again, I don't know why they cut it so short. Again, this scene also had an extension where um, Jack and Juan talk about, you know, what happens if, like with Kong, like, what do they do if, like, either Kong survives or Kong dies, and the whole bit where, um, Jessica, or Dwan says, you know, don't tease me, I'm serious, Jack says, so am I, if that monkey doesn't make it out, we'll have him on our backs for the rest of our lives, we'll never be able to look each other in the eye, it's, it's the truth, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know why that bit was cut out, too, because that's a great moment, it shows what's gonna happen to these two if Kong makes it or not. And I really wish they left that in as well. Of course, Jack finds out that um, the World Trade Centers look exactly like the two rock pillars at Kong's Lair. It's kind of well put together, and it's, it's kind of an interesting. A uh, way to tie how why Kong would climb the World Trade Center, why he would climb a tower. It's to get to the highest place imaginable, because it's closer to his home. What do you think? Is he flipped out or? 
The scene is also really great with the two, with uh, Jack and uh, the mayor talking about, you know, make a deal, let's capture Kong, don't kill him. And of course these, these bastards are lying like a, like a mother, holy crap. <laughs> It does show tension that, you know, Jack is not wanting to hold information unless they keep their word. Because he knows they're going to kill him. But he just wants to make sure they keep their word. Jessica Lang just looks gorgeous, honestly. I've said that a number of times in this commentary, but I'm sorry. She looks, she looks absolutely beautiful in this movie. She actually, when she got the role, um, she apparently had to get her braces removed. That's how young she was, and uh, obviously had to take acting lessons at the time. And this, this got her a Golden Globe. This got her a Golden Globe Award for Best uh, New Actress. This scene, I, I believe this stuff with Kong in the hand, uh, they rebuilt the bar in a, um, in a, on a stage so they could fit the hand through. The scene was also longer in the extended cut, with a few more bits of Kong peering through the window, which, honestly, that looks so creepy. Like, that's something out of Stephen King's It. <laughs> like, the Tim Curry one. They all float down here. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. Of course... Rick Baker, miniature set with blue screen, walking towards the real world trade center. I love this whole church scene. Um, I don't know who plays the priest in this, but I always think it's Dino De Laurentiis making a cameo. I'm not too sure. Um, I like to think that, but obviously, probably not. This scene was also longer in the extended cut with Kong walking through the streets and everything, which had more effect shots. One of them had a mix of Dwan and the mechanical hand with Kong running on a treadmill through a back plated background of the streets and apparently they felt it was too fake looking and it didn't look good but later they put it in the extended cut again yeah, the World Trade Center shot amazing in the sequence uh, they actually they had a lot of uh, extras in the sequence they had to get like the the National Guard in and then they had to get actors dressed as policemen a lot of extras were in the scene, and they filmed this in a matter of, like, a few nights. And the Port Authority was so concerned that they were going to, like, there were going to be so many people at the plaza that they were going to, you know, collapse the, the, the flooring. So there were a couple times they had to shut down the movie because they were so concerned about the amount of people there, especially with the um, styrofoam Kong, the dead Kong that you see later in the movie. I think here we should bring it uh, back to Rick Baker, who takes a uh, kind of a final look back on uh, the making of this film. I think anybody who's worn a gorilla costume since the time that I did King Kong has benefited from the fact, so, uh, one that I've made, has benefited from the fact that I've been inside one of those. I was inside that costume for nine months, I believe, and I know what it's like to be in that. I try to make my costumes so they're comfortable and you can get in and out of them, and, and if you have to go to the bathroom. You, you can, you don't have to hold it all day. You know, and, and, uh, I, I've learned from that experience. The scene is also very powerful because it shows that Kong is, like, he's very vulnerable and he's very sympathetic in this scene because you realize this could be his last stand. That's, of course, the Miniature World Trade Center uh, with uh, Kong climbing it. I believe Will Shepard did the majority of the climbing on this sequence. Jessica Lang on the big Kong in front of a blue screen. And when Jeff Bridges, when they went into this first thing of the World Trade Center, um, it was newly built at the time, much like the original Kong where the Empire State Building was just newly built when they started shooting and added that for the ending. Um, same thing with the World Trade Center. It was brand new at the time, and they decided it would make a much better sequence. And because it's a lot bigger, and Kong, since Kong's bigger, make the tower bigger. A lot of this is, um, I believe, Will or Rick Baker climbing the, the miniature building in front of a blue screen on the floor so they could add in the stuff later. Um, when they shot these below shots, they had to shoot it literally at the top of the towers and build like a 2 by 4 platform and set the camera down and look down on them, which I, I, can, I can probably imagine had 
massive vertigo with a, a sequence like this. And this scene here with uh, Kong climbing and uh, through the window where Jack is, uh, this is also, I, I believe, Rick Baker climbing a scaffolding on a blue screen that they uh, matted in with uh, Jeff Bridges on a window of the Trade Center where they added a uh, uh, blue screen. This here is Rick Baker in a close-up shot. Really great close-up shot. This is iconic to me with Kong 76 as this shot. And here's the World Trade Center miniature background. Um, or the miniature itself. It looks great. Um, a lot of blue screen was done on this sequence. Of course, Lang in front of blue screen and Baker in blue screen mat with a live shot of New York. And I believe this was actually on the top of the Trade Center as well, with um, Jessica in the uh, mechanical hand, and they actually brought some of the Big Kong up to uh, shoot that sequence for the climax. And uh, here comes the flamethrower guys, uh, which is um, really interesting. I. When I first watched this movie, I did not see that coming. I was like, wait, why, why are they using flamethrowers? I thought it was supposed to be airplanes and guns and everything. Apparently they had such a hard time getting the uh, World Trade Center for the finale. Um, there were such like arguments with the Port Authority and everything, and they actually considered going to the Empire State Building as a backup plan, which they were all welcome for. But um, unfortunately they didn't, and they went with this and this instead. Um... But, uh, it, this, this climax actually is really, really kind of true. Out of all the Kongs, it's the most tragic. Jessica Lang in the big Kong with the blue screen. And then this is Will Shepard doing the, uh, jump leap and, uh, doing that whole stunt bit. A lot of, uh, the World Trade Center top miniatures were shot on the uh, soundstage in a darkened room and uh, I believe the, the miniature of the Trade Center went all the way almost up to the rooftop and uh, especially where the helicopters in later that came in later they had to get um, like room and space enough space it out so that the choppers could come in and circle around and I feel like this is like right out of Donkey Kong they're just throwing barrels and stuff Love it. Oh, that's amazing. He's just able to take out those those assholes. It's a great victorious moment, but short-lived by the helicopters. Uh, originally, they did want to use jets um, to shoot down Kong, and they were going to use Canadian jets, surprisingly. But unfortunately, they couldn't uh, do that, so they instead went with, with uh, Huey H-1 helicopters and uh, with miniguns. And this whole sequence, actually, Kong was supposed to swat, um, the miniature Kong was supposed to swat at, like, radio-controlled flying helicopters. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the choppers were, were so dangerous, flying-wise, that they could have, you know, chopped Baker's head off. So instead they went with, uh, a simple track on top of the soundstage that they put wire helicopters on and had that entirety be, that whole thing be the sequence. Of course, you have uh, Jessica, fi or Duan, finally realizing that Kong, you know, is trying loves her, you know, and, and it's really sad. It's a really sad, tragic moment for both of them. And out of all the sequences, this was the most bloody uh, of, of the climaxes. Uh, I believe what they did to get the blood effects was that they had uh, somebody shoot like. Um, paintball pellets with fake blood at Rick Baker and make the blood effects. Um, some of the shots also had uh, uh, Rick Baker at a um, air, air, uh, air, an, an Air Force uh, place 
and uh, he would stand on top of a platform, and the actual helicopters would fly in and shoot at, shoot at him with blanks, and he had to wear a protection thing from hot shells and everything in case they hit him. Um, other times it is miniature work, and other times it's uh, blue screen work. And I, I, some people think the blue screen shots here don't really look that good. I think they look perfectly fine. So again, tr the tracking helicopters here with the on the track on the roof. It's hard to talk because you're so emotionally invested in these characters and the, the tragedy of the whole damn thing. Like, even as a kid, this was extremely upsetting. Of course, they would use that shot of Kong smashing the choppers twice. Just Kong really got really got messed up the whole time, and all the actors like really show the best emotions here. I think we're gonna turn it over to uh, Dino De Laurentiis um, to give a final thought on uh, the ending of the movie. Kong working this movie like a human being, his expression, his eyes. It look like a real human being. This is the reason you cry at the end. A women cry. You know why? Because the Kong is capable to die for his for his women. For his love. For his love. For his love. Sure. I don't I don't know how many men today, if we are ready to die. Jessica Lang on blue screen when Kong falls. This shot I think is a little outdated because it's just Rick Baker laying on a mat and they just zoom in on him falling. And then of course we have the Styrofoam Kong. This is the Kong that was made entirely out of styrofoam and uh, put together in front of the plaza of the Trade Center and they shot this whole sequence in a matter of I believe five, three or five nights. And these bits, close-ups with Rick Baker when he was dying. Uh, fun thing to note, uh, Jessica Lang was there when he shot that sequence to interact with them. Like, they didn't shoot her a bit of the scene, but when he's laying down there dying, uh, she was there to, like, kind of interact with him to help the sequence out, which I think is really, really, give her props to be there for the miniature Kong work. So the uh, Styrofoam Kong, they ended up uh, building this thing out of Styrofoam and adding latex skin and fur and everything. But when they shot it and the uh, crowd comes in, the first take they did, uh, they had like a whole couple thousand people show up. And the first take they did, they uh, stormed in and they went past the barriers, past the guards, past Jessica, and just started ripping through Kong, gathering all these super souvenirs. They grabbed hair, Kong's eye, one of his eyes went missing, one of his fingertips went missing, and a lot of people said Kong got mugged right here. Kong got mugged in this whole sequence. Uh, but luckily they were able to replace it and everything. The Styrofoam Kong actually ended up afterwards going to a theme park in Italy, um, and it lasted there for a very long time, at least till like the early to mid-90s. Um, I'm not sure if it's there anymore, um, but it'd be interesting to find this thing and be able to bring it back um, for uh, a museum or something. The climax is also very, very tragic, I think, because um, you have, like, Jack and Dwan don't really end up together. You know, she's overwhelmed with emotion. She wants to be with Jack, and Jack's disgusted by her. And it, it, it is a really sad moment for both of them. Out of all the Kong movies, this is probably the most tragic out of all of them. Like, it's the more emotional and everything. And of course, we pan out. This was the final shot um, in the movie. Well, obviously, besides the credits. And it's ruined by the guy waving there! Like, that's, that's my only grave, is that that shot, that great shot is ruined by that wave, guy waving in the corner. Uh, if anybody noticed that now, well, there you go, the movie's ruined for you. <laughs> but 
But yeah, that's it for um, watching this movie. Um, this is something I wanted to do for a while because I know my uh, my review went on a lot. Like it went over really well, and it's like one of my most popular reviews. And I wanted to talk about this film much further because. There's not really any documentaries or interviews or commentaries about this film. It's mostly forgotten by the Kong fan base, which I think is a shame. I do feel like it should get some sort of two-disc Blu-ray DVD or something in the future, especially with the 40th anniversary this month. And um, But I figured, you know, I'd give something out there, pay my respects to uh, the film itself, because it is my favorite film of all time, next to the original. And... Yeah, I just I, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you got a little bit of insight of what it took to make this film. I hope I gave you some new uh, facts about the film and when they made it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the archival interviews because it took me forever to find them. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I think that's all I got to say about this movie, guys. So um, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'd say definitely take a look at it a second time. Maybe watch it without this commentary. And it was just fun to look back on this film, especially for the 40th anniversary. So, I guess for now, uh, rate, comment, subscribe. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope to maybe do more commentaries in the future. I think this was actually kind of fun. Uh, they're just a little difficult to do. <laughs> but um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. And I guess I'll see you guys later. So until the next video, or when the, my version of Kong comes out, rate, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video. This is Big Jack Films, signing off.